focused on the Battle of the Bulge as an illustration of the importance of us combat engineers. And thank you, thank you. <laughs> this is going to be a long day, I can tell. Uh, yeah, no, no. But uh, Kent Strapko, who is somewhere, was here, maybe he's upstairs. Both Kent and I were combat engineers. We both served in Vietnam. I stuck around just a little longer than Kent. Uh, so whenever we talk about the Battle of the Bulge, we always think of the 101st Airborne, the 10th Armored Division, the fabulous, you know, uh, battles around Baston, uh, Third Armored, I uh, was Third Army, you know, the relief. You might think of the 99th Division and the defense of the Elsinbourne Ridge. Uh, the sad story of the 106th Division, who just got clobbered, basically destroyed. And all of that, and much has been written. Uh, but I want to kind of least, uh, blow our own horn a little bit for us combat engineers who also were involved. And actually, during the critical first couple days uh, of the war and the attack, particularly in the north, played a critical role in frustrating uh, the German advance. Uh, just as kind of set the stage, uh, in the late 70s, uh, I served with a combat battalion in Germany. And we were stationed, well, we were direct support to 3rd Armored Division and 5th Corps, which was in the central area of our NATO area. In fact, the interesting, 5th Corps and 3rd Armored Division uh, participated in the Battle of the Bulge as well. They were part of 1st Army. Uh, we were based you know, a little bit outside of Frankfurt. Third Armored Division was the covering force for our sector. That meant if an attack suddenly came, they dropped everything, raced up to the border, spread themselves out, and just engaged the enemy as it came, the Russians, East Germans. They, their expected lifespan was going to be 36 hours. The, the, what they're trying to do is just buy time. Their divisional engineer unit went along with them. We followed up immediately after. As soon, we would move at the same time as the covering force. The main rest of the force of NATO delays until the covering force kind of gets there and gets engaged. Our mission was we'd immediately race out to a local ammo dump, load our five-ton trucks up with everything we could get our hands on, basically more ammunition, cratering charges, mines, explosives. And then we would race up right behind them, not all the way to the front, but would be operating right in here. Uh, and we would start putting in obstacles wherever we could. Every month, if we knew that we were going to get an alert at some point, normally 2 o'clock in the morning. And you could kind of see later in the month, you know, if nothing happened, you just had your whole bags packed. Uh, just standing by the door, you, you would know you would have to call all your people and say, okay, you don't go anywhere. We need to know how to get in touch with you. So we would get a call, and within two and a half hours, we were supposed to be out the gate and heading north. Uh, we didn't always have to do it. Some, you know, some alerts, we would go all the way up uh, to the ammunition dump and start loading stuff. Others, they would kind of be saying, okay, looks like you've got your act together, you can go home. Uh, but that's how we spent the three years. Uh, and that gave us kind of some insight into what the other engineer battalions did during World War II, kind of. Because we practice everything. So anyway, let, to, before we get into it, I'll give you a short education on the engineers, Corps of Engineers. Our crest is a castle. It represents the role of the engineers in both building fortifications and then storming them. Looking at our crest, it's kind of interesting. First of all, our motto, Essayance, it's French. Hmm. Not British? No. Got the castle. Scarlet, the color here, is for artillery. 
It represents the close connection between military engineers back in the 15th, 16th, 17th century with artillery because artillery was big, heavy, and needed help to move around. The white color is the white is the color of infantry, French infantry, uh, and stuff. And so that continues today. What does essay on mean? Uh, let us try. Thank you. Yeah. Well, how did the Corps of Engineers get organized? We always think of West Point as this place which created all these fabulous generals and stuff. Well, looking back through the Revolutionary War, time and again, uh, General Washington complained about the lack of trained military engineers for us, the US. The British had them and he admired it. The French had them. We didn't. All the, what military engineers we had were kind of self-trained. Uh, and they did all right. But he, you know, once the war was over, he just kept saying, Congress, amongst other things, you know, we need to have a school to train a corps of engineers. And in 1802, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who had no love for the military <laughs> at all, uh, finally signed a, a law, whatever, which established a school for a corps of engineers to be located at West Point, New York. And they chose West Point because that was kind of a critical location during the Revolutionary War. And we did have some troops stationed there. Well, historically, uh, you were trained as a military engineer, whether or not you think of Ulysses Grant, Lee, and the rest of them. And in fact, the early days of Robert E. Lee and stuff was spent as an engineer at various locations designing building uh, lighthouses, port fortifications and stuff. And during the period post-Mexican War and everything, most of the early maps for the West and everything that were put together were put together by graduates of West Point who were trained as topographic engineers. Actually, even up to the time I graduated in 1968, you did not, there were no majors for us. Everyone basically got out with a bachelor of science degree, very heavy on engineering. Uh, as plebes, we all had to take drafting. Uh, they stopped the requirement for us to learn how to do military sketching. But in the place we took it, there were just marvelous old sketches and colored water things on the wall of all the famous generals in the past that we'd seen. We also ha all had to take surveying, you know, every one of us. I mean, the, the plane out there on West Point is probably the most surveyed area <laughs> you could ever imagine. <laughs> things have progressed, though. Now you can major in a whole variety of things. And I'm sure the plebes don't take drafting and surveying anymore at all. But, you know, life's come a little more complicated. Uh, when I, senior year, you could pick what branch you wanted. And this was infantry, armor, artillery. Uh, maybe you could go air defense once you went into artillery. Uh, engineers and signal, that was it. So you better be happy. I wanted engineers because I liked engineering. I didn't want my main purpose is to get out there and kill people. Uh, I like building things. But I also like playing infantry at times. And so to me, that was a great combination. Plus, the engineer people that I had met, who were teachers and all that stuff, always whispered in our ear and said, hey, shh, engineers like sending their officers back to graduate school in engineering. <laughs> infantry, not so much. You know, so I figured, what the heck. Our main battlefield missions, I mean, we, we train and do all of that stuff. But they're kind of, you know, listed here. Mobility, helping us, our forces to move around, prevent the enemy, helping us surviving. You need something built, we can do it. And topographic engineering. Uh, mapping is still vitally important. We had a whole section at Fifth Corps headquarters, which were our topographic engineers. 
and whatever exercise we had come up, they could generate whatever kind of map you needed, telling you everything. Uh, and that's important. And of course, fight as infantry. The type of units we do have. Now I'm talking the Army engineers. What gets confusing is we have the Army, US Army Corps of Engineers who is the civilian side. And that's the group which manages a lot of our natural resources, our waterways. Uh, we, we manage the Superfund cleanup program. We do environmental cleanup. We do all the building that like the bases. Well, yeah, a, a lot of emergency response and stuff. But I'm not talking about that. Divisional combat engineers are units that are uh, tied directly to a division, you know, right at the hip. Uh, whatever that division commander wants, oops, let me go back. Core level is the next group up. You got the divisions here, you got the overall core, you're gonna have some additional engineer units that give you a, a capacity to do lots of things, bridging uh, and stuff that you normally don't need right up front. But the core commander can reassign you as needed. Uh, construction engineers, uh, they're the big heavy guys. They can build airfields, they can do everything. Uh, but you're not going to find them up front. They're going to be way back in the, the theater area. In topographic, we mentioned at port construction engineers. The first unit I was in was a port construction company. It's a, a company, but you have, you have about 500 people. You're about the size of a battalion. You have landing crafts. You have a diving section. You have big cranes. And you have barge sets that you can create. Uh, we only had two during the Vietnam era. One was in Vietnam. The unit I was with, they kept saying, load up and get ready to go, but we never did. Nowadays, I think we just hire out. Uh, I don't think they exist anymore. And then we had a lot of specialty stuff during World War II. None of that exists. The typical combat engineer equipment is interesting. That's the basic TOE for a heavy equipment in a, in a divisional combat unit. That's exactly the TOE I had when I commanded a company in Vietnam. That's exactly the TOE I had when I was with the 317th in Germany in 1977. If you put World War II TOE equipment next to what we had in the 70s, it would look almost identical, just a little more modern. Back then, certainly during World War II and even Vietnam, water purification units were attached to us because, you know, one way to really get a lot of people sick is have contaminated water out. Uh, by the 70s, uh, those units were dropped. Uh, I think we have bigger logistics hubs and stuff that could provide that. Down at the squad level, you basically pioneer tools, chainsaws, demolition kits, mine detectors, nothing heavy. You know, uh, an infantry company would look at that and go, Pfft. you know, you can't stop anything. Well, that's not kind of our major role. Uh, but whether I was in Vietnam or Germany, you know, okay, we had the M16 now. We had the M60. We still had the 50 caliber. Boy, that thing stuck around forever. Uh, bazookas, no. We had light anti-tank <coughs> weapons. Yeah, we had a lot of that stuff. You know, when you look at it, we kind of consider ourselves, when you look at it, we're just a good old general contractor company with guns. You know, <laughs> you know call us, we'll show up. So what do we do? Well, we can do a lot to ruin someone's day. And that's kind of was the focus during the early days of the Battle of the Bulge. We can put out mines all over the place. We can blow bridges. We can create abatis. That means if you got a forest trail, you got a lot of trees along the side, well, you don't blow them down completely. You blow them over so they interlap, you know, and it creates a marvelous obstacle. And then you sprinkle it with mines and you're going nowhere. <laughs> you know, with dozers, you can just create ditches. You can push debris in the way of things. Oh, yeah. Hmm. 
uh, barbed wire, you know, concertina wire, all sorts of stuff. We can, cre we can do marvelous things with that. And you can't drive, if you put a triple strand concertina barrier here and drive a tank over it, that tank's going to get about another 50 yards before it's all caught up in its treads and its wheels with the wire. And then, obviously, fight as infantry. And that's what we ended up doing quite a bit early on in the, in the Battle of the Bulge. Then the offense, you just reverse it. You know, you try and get rid of mines and demolitions. You push debris off the side. You breach barriers. You build bridges. Yeah, every time you blow a bridge, yeah. you're gonna, you know you're going to have to rebuild it. <laughs> so you don't blow them unless you absolutely have to. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the Bailey Bridge. That's the anathema of all engineers, but it was the most marvelous large erector set you could ever imagine for bridge building. And of course, float bridging. In fact, what's interesting is both the 51st and the 291st actually put float bridges across the Rhine River, one above river, one down from the Remagen Bridge, uh, almost uh, within days of us uh, seizing the bridge because we knew at some point we'd lose it. Uh, oh, phooey. Uh, the Engineer Bible, how do we know all this stuff? There's a manual called FM 534, and I brought one with me. And I saw him put it out here. Well, I'll, now it's not there. Uh, Craig, how about look in the library or on the table? That is a handy dandy little thing which tells you everything you need to know. All good engineers, officers, we carried it. It fit perfectly into my M14 ammo pouch. Every senior uh, NCO has it. Tells you everything you need to know and everything you're going to be tested on ever, mm -hmm. you know, as part of your normal training process with it. And I carried that, and it says Captain Fellows back then, but that's what I carried in Vietnam. Kent carried one. Uh, we used it all the time. Most uh, as kind of a reference of what you needed to do for ordering things. Uh, but it's a marvelous kind of thing. And look for, okay, the versatile Bailey Bridge. This, this was designed by a British, uh, a Donald Bailey, uh, because in response to a, a, a RFP type thing from the British government for a bridge, component bridge system that could be built by hand in many cases, uh, but would have tremendous capability. What you're seeing here, oh, there we go. Just pass that around. You can take a look. A couple things you can notice here. This is called a double single. That means you have double panels on the side, but only one high. You could build this double, 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 triple, depending how, what the load you want to carry. It can be completely assembled for smaller spans by hand. And then lo and behold, you get everyone together and you push like crazy and you can push it across a span. If it's anything big, you'll use a bulldozer. But let, uh, okay, is that cord plugged in, Bob, into the, video? yeah. This is kind of walks you through how it's built. Did you plug it into the, yeah, okay. I love the music. <laughs> Whoops, excuse me. So what happens, you call up a bridge company, they deliver it with some expertise, you provide the labor. You need four people to actually manhandle uh, each panel. But just kind of look at that, it's pretty ingenious how it comes together. And then you just pound the pins in that help connect it or bolt it. You've put, that's the double single going to be. That's the nose. It's on these rollers here. Now, sometimes you're doing that while nasty people are shooting at you. <laughs> so then you can put the treadway in. These kind of give stability to the panels.
We had to train on that constantly. So a well-trained group, how long would it take you to build one? Yeah. Uh, well, from the time it was delivered, and if the span was, let's say, uh, uh, 100 feet or something like that, uh, probably three hours. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's quick. Uh, and well, how, how, many, how many men would it take? Well, you'd, a whole company probably would be involved with this because you need four, four men to handle each panel and position it. You need a bunch of others with hammers and the pins. Uh, then you got the, the treading. So what happens, you got to get across the river too, kind of where you're going. This is just the nose section. So Maybe. once it gets there, you take that off. You then crank it down. Louder, please. Yeah, you, at this point, you would crank it down off the rollers <laughs> so it'll be steady. Would you enlist infantrymen to help? No. 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 All you don't want an infantryman. <laughs> well, yes. Thank you. No. no, no, I shouldn't say that. They're the ones on the other side providing you protection. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 They're shooting at the bad guys, right? Yeah. But they, we literally built hundreds of them as we kind of went across France on into. Because, you know, we were very good at blowing up the bridges that originally were there. Right. So anyway, there? well, the interesting thing is you'll still see Bailey bridges all around. In fact, when they, the newspaper, well, the news had a big thing about the big storms through Puerto Rico, and it showed a short image of a bridge being washed away. Well, that bridge was a Bailey bridge. Wow. And actually on the civilian side, there's something comparable. Uh, last summer, I was over at Grand Lake camping and stuff, and they were replacing part of a bridge section. And lo and behold, looked an awful lot like a Bailey Bridge to me. <laughs> section was just quickly put in place so traffic could go. Wow. And then you just disassemble it. Right. Yes. What's the longest span you could? Oh, well, you see, here's a, here's a good example one. We blew the bridge, obviously, here, but we needed to replace it. So, you know, this is probably 200 feet and stuff. And as long as you're going to have some intermediate supports, and that's why we always cut down trees and create, you know, all sorts of wood things, then we will build an intermediate support and then bingo. Uh, you can build one actually strong enough to carry a train across it. That's what makes it so ver versatile. Where, so, where did you get the decking material? Is that like oh, that comes with the kit. Oh, that oh, the kit. <laughs> you, yeah, basically our role is there, as the combat engineer out here, you say, hmm, we're going to need a bridge X number of feet across here, and then we send that back to core. They get to the bridge companies, and they say, no, they don't. They need more than they're asking. And so then they'll package it up in X number of sections to do it, and then send it on out. But during the war, wouldn't they use source local trees? And oh, yeah, that's trees? exactly, and then we'll get to that. Okay. So anyway, let's get back to the original story here. Uh, July, we've, you know, June 6, you know, the Normandy landing. It took us until almost the end of July when we finally could break out. You know, that was third, Ar third Army, you know, f getting out through this way. Uh, 21st Army Group, which was Montgomery's group, involved the Canadian First Army and the British Second Army. They came up the coast to try and capture these ports because until we could capture some ports, all supplies had to come across the beachhead. Uh, and that's a real pain. Uh, we eventually captured Cherbourg, but the Germans were very good at messing it up. Mm -hmm. So all the engineer units that basically came across immediately after the landings were initially trying to get the ports going and setting up where we could bring stuff over the, over the you know, beaches. Uh, the 291st and the 51st combat battalions came across about a week after the main landings. 
they were totally occupied with helping to prepare the bridge sites, getting rid of obstacles. And then as First Army started moving up quickly up here, they were doing their favorite things, having to remove obstacles and build bridges. And that was just constant, you heard. Well, the key target by the British was to capture Antwerp. That's a major port. And we needed to capture that to shorten our supply line. Uh, again, you know, we remember the Red Ball Express and all of that. Well, the engineer battalions were trying to maintain the road so the Red Ball Express could operate. But anyway, by September, the British had captured Antwerp, but it had not yet captured the land leading out from there. This called the shelled area. Uh, the Germans were still there. So you can have the port open, but you certainly can't come up the channel there because the Germans will just shoot you to bits. So right around September, early, well, October, they finally captured that. So they were beginning to operate and try and get the port open. So this is kind of where the story begins. By October, this was kind of our, the advance we had. Uh, Good old Operation Market Garden by Montgomery didn't work out. Uh, forces down here got chewed up as we were trying to go out, you know, through the south and the Herkton Forest and all that stuff. Essentially, we were exhausted. And that's why we basically stopped right along here, along the Ardennes for First Army, uh, because it seemed like a good place to stop, <laughs> if for nothing else. Well, what precipitated the, you know, what we call the Ardennes counteroffensive, you know, or Watch on the Rhine or the Battle of the Bulge? Things are going pretty bad, obviously, for the Germans. On the Eastern Front, you know, their group model, Group B, their center, you know, main force there has just been eliminated by the Russians. You know, they're beginning to move forward and getting ready for their big winter offensive. Uh, somehow or another, you know, uh, Hitler got the idea that if he could come up with some massive thrust up here, capture Antwerp, will have distributed, will have disrupted all our ability to resupply, will have separated the British and the main U.S. forces. Uh, he knew that Montgomery and Bradley weren't on the best of terms uh, and stuff. And somehow got the idea that, ah, if they could do that, then he would crush the 21st Army Group and 1st Army up here. We would say, we give up. Let's, uh, you know, negotiate a, uh, you know, peace treaty. And now let's all go fight the Russians. Uh-uh. But anyway, that was kind of the intent. Now, how were they going to do this? Well, let's see. They were going to have four army groups, 15th Army Group way up north, Aachen. Main thrust was simply to kind of protect the flank. The main thrust was going to be 6th Panzer Army. Their mission was within two days to get across the Meuse River, two more days get up and capture Antwerp. Now what they were going to do once they caught it, they weren't too certain, but anyway. There also was the other problem is there wasn't enough fuel for all the Panther tanks and Tiger tanks to even get there. So you had another mission to find some supply depots and stuff. Fifth Panzer Army had the mission, and again, they were strongly, these both were Panzers. They were loaded up with tanks, armored vehicles, and everything. Their thrust was to simply get through there as fast as you could and get up to Brussels, still get across the Meuse or and stuff. And then the Seventh Army was strictly leg. They just hoped they could go anywhere and protect the flank. Did we have this intelligence? No, this time? all came later. Okay. Uh, six Panzer Army, two Panzer Divisions, Volks Grenadier, which mainly is infantry, a special Panzer Brigade by this Otto Skorzeny, which was supposedly going to be organized and captured U.S. vehicles and tanks 
their soldiers would be wearing U.S. uniforms and so they could infiltrate in behind our lines and create all sorts of havoc. Mm -hmm. And the idea was they also were going to kind of infiltrate, get up to the Meuse River and seize some of those bridges and hold it. Who won the World Series? Yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll mention that. Uh, General Joseph Joseph Dietrich was picked as the head of Six Panzer Group. This again was the main thrust. This reflects what finally happened. Uh, and the leading of the main thrust here was uh, a gentleman, well I don't know if I'd call him a gentleman, but oh, Lieutenant Colonel Joaquin yeah. Piper. Uh, 29th, a really aggressive tank commander made a real name for himself on the Eastern Front, being ruthless and, uh, yeah, essentially. Uh, so he was given the spearhead attack for the 6th Panzer Army. About 5,000 uh, Waffen-SS troops, uh, let's see, 2,800 pieces, no, uh, let's see, I'm trying to always have to get the numbers straight. Uh, let's see, he had uh, about 80 Mark IV tanks, 45 Tiger tanks, a whole bunch of uh, armored vehicles and stuff. He had engineers and artillery as well. But the thought was he would just race right through, grab some key bridges, uh, and keep going. And that didn't happen. No, not quite. Uh, just uh, our counter again, the 291st Engineer Battalion and 51st. Uh, David Pergren was the commander of the 291st, uh, graduate of Penn State, uh, civil engineer, perfect fit for that, was with the battalion from the beginning. Uh, in fact, the battalions were organized uh, in Texas, uh, Camp Bowie and, a, and another camp there, and did a bunch of training, and again, ended up coming to Europe. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Fraser, West Point graduate, give some credit there, uh, was the commander for the 51st, yeah. Could I interrupt? Yes. Harry Fraser was the president of South Coast Bull of Mines when I attended there. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, yeah, say that again, yeah, louder. Harry Fraser was the president of the South Coast School of Mines and Technology when I attended there in the middle 60s. Well, uh, how about that? Uh, yeah, we all have some decent careers after the military. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, just as we kind of mentioned here, both the 51st and the 291st uh, landed in Normandy, did all the typical missions you could kind of think of. The interesting thing, just with the 51st, is when they went, to, went over to Europe, they were sent to Oran, Algeria. Their equipment was sent to Los Angeles and shipped to Asia. <laughs> so by the time they got to Algeria, the decision was, well, maybe we don't need you, you know, there. Uh, we'll need you in England. So they came to England as an engineer unit without equipment and eventually got matched up again. So anyway, that's kind of what they did. The thing about engineers that I've always liked is you're always busy. You know, with infantry, artillery, and the rest of that, you know, you fight like hell and all that stuff, but then you, when it's, you're not fighting, you're kind of cleaning equipment and, and training again. Well, for engineers, you're always doing something. Uh, and you have all the equipment to take care of yourself. You know, no engineer unit ever in the field was living really hard up, unless you're really fighting. Uh, so anyway, just to again talk, the reason I'm showing this again is we're going to be talking really about this area. In fact, we're only going to be talking about from about here to here. The 291st operated up along through here. The 51st operated down from Marsh on up through there. Interesting to note, you know, that's as far as they kind of got. And that's kind of the areas which went along major rivers and things like that. And lo and behold, the engineers were there before the Germans 
who kind of made it difficult for them to kind of get across. But we're going to talk a few things. We'll coming back. Elsinborn, Elsinborn Ridge, Malbany, also related to the massacre. Saint Vith, a little bit. Hufalis toward the tail end, even though it's not related there. But I have a story. Get looking a little closer now. This is where the Six Pans Army was, lined up right here. Elsinborn actually was the headquarters uh, CP for the 99th Division. Again, we've got Malmody, Stavlot, that's going to crop up. Uh, the unfortunate 106th Division was right down below. Uh, it's not that they were a bad division, it's just that they were brand new, had just gotten into position, were spread out over horrendous area, uh, never had enough forces there that <coughs> could stop a major thrust. Well, it was a quiet area. Well, the whole area was a quiet area. Uh, for a while. And then the 14th Cavalry Group was slipped in here for some reason. This was a recon group. This is just light vehicles, light equipment. They're supposed to be moving around. But they were said, no, you're defending this pit of space. And this is where the Loshen Gap was. And this is where, during the initial thing, they just poured right through there. Kind of like the Fulda Gap in Germany. We were worried for the Russians. Now, quick talk of topography in the northern area. Uh, northern area actually was much more challenging than the center area, around Bastogne and all of that. That kind of opened up into some more flat areas. But if anyone's been in Europe in the wintertime, fall, early spring, it's miserable. Uh, mainly wet, damp. Uh, if you get a cold screen, you'll get 12 inches of snow, wet snow. This gives you kind of an idea of this area. Actually, this is a picture of the town of Hufalis, uh, and it's very typical. That, you know, many towns are in, down in the lower valley areas. Uh, others are up top. Lots of woods. Any place you've got a low area, you're going to have a stream. Uh, you're going to have some larger rivers. Uh, and when you look at the buildings and the construction there, they're not wood like what we have here. They're all stone. Uh, everything from farmhouses, you know, this is a, a little uh, uh, hotel, you know, bistro type thing. Everything is stone. That means, one, they're harder to destroy. Two, literally every building, unless you've destroyed it by a tank or artillery round, becomes essentially a fortified pillbox. And that's exactly how they kind of operated. Bridges there, lots of smaller bridges, farm bridges and stuff, uh, could carry cars, uh, farm vehicles. Only in the major towns did you have massive bridges. And this is the bridge in Stavlon, massive stone bridge. Uh, dang difficult to destroy. Uh, simply because of the massive stone and everything with it. So anyway, from October to December, uh, both engineers finally had stopped moving. Every day you had to move. Now they shifted to a different kind of um, routine. They were charged with operating every sawmill you could find in the area to create lumber and stuff that was going to be used for the winterization uh, of our soldiers, and particularly those up along the front lines. Lumber is very valuable. You use it to build and reinforce uh, your fortifications. If you're going to be stuck in a foxhole, you don't want to be standing in the dirt and things. You'd like to have something on there. So what I've just kind of highlighted here is within the 291st, again, a couple things here. Well, Butenbach. Just underneath Ellsborn was where the 99th Division had their SCP, or CP. Actually, SPA was the headquarters for whole, the whole of First Army. Uh, and then we got Malmedy here along the Wash River. We got the Psalm coming up here. Or actually, actually that's the Psalm. This is the Ambalev. And uh, what I just wanted to show is the division, the engineers now were scattered all around. And they weren't directly near the front. Uh, so what the heck was happening? 
you know, on 16 December, the Germans opened up along 90 kilometer front, massive artillery strikes, you know, barrages, and then started moving in. The first kind of indication, which was reported by the engineers, in other words, you know, you basically lost landline communications, radio combo was all messed up. Uh, for the engineers back along in here in the various locations they were, you could hear a low rumble, continuous. But even around here, if you're in a little valley area and it's kind of damp, sounds get muffled. You may not even hear what's going on. And the first kind of indications, some aircraft were attacking something. We're beginning to get some reports of vehicles with U.S. markings, but kind of really acting strangely, moving around. Uh, and now stragglers and all sorts of vehicles are beginning to cloud the roads and they're not moving this way, they're moving this way. Uh, again, at this point in time, there, everywhere you had a major bridge, Trois Point being a big one, Stavelot, Malmedy, and others in this stretch, uh, all these crossings had no, no uh, army uh, infantry you know, standing around uh, because this was a quiet area. So what happens, the first thing that goes out whoops, is get your little butts back together again and get to every bridge crossing you can find uh, that's significant. And you're going to protect that until you're relieved. So both the 291st and the you know, 51st, which I don't, can't really show in this thing, uh, pull their people in. And in some cases, they were the only units. We got Malmedy, Stavlot, Tra Point here uh, as key ones. Uh, they were the only units there around. So again, we've kind of uh, talked about what's moving here. So you're moving uh, you know, a bunch of the engineer units around. They're taking whatever they got with them. Uh, and OK. So fortunately, what happened, uh, everything, as we all know, anytime you have a plan of action, you know, as soon as you start it, it's going to get screwed up. And fortunately, that's what happened to the Germans as well. A uh, couple things. They were expecting the 99th and all those in Elsenborn to just kind of more or less collapse, uh, but they didn't. In fact, they held up very strongly. Uh, there was a small little uh, I and R platoon, I guess there's more down in here, uh, which just refused to give up. And they held up the advance of the German force through there for about six hours till they ran out of ammunition, unfortunately, uh, and stuff. Uh, Piper in particular got really frustrated because there was a railroad bridge under, actually it was an underpass on their side, which had been destroyed. And someone forgot to clean it out or clear it uh, so he could get through. And lo and behold, his advance was held up 16 hours while they finally got some engineers there to kind of clear it out. So once that happened, then he kind of got on onto a move here. But er, at that point, everything was really kind of messed up. And again, the fuel situation was really aggravated uh, because when you got a tank sitting around idling, mm -hmm. uh, although they t I'm sure it turned them off, uh, it uses a lot of fuel. So anyway, here's kind of the story what we're going to be getting into. Piper's kind of chugging away down through here. He actually wanted to come up and cross at Malmody. At that point, the 291st was the only unit there. Colonel Paragon was there. They will show some stuff. They put out all sorts of roadblocks and enough action going on that the initial Germans kind of coming up said, oh, there's, maybe we don't want to go there. So instead, they decided to push on towards Stavelot. Well, again, this is kind of what Malmody. Uh, thing to recognize, initially, the only units there were the engineers. A lot of other units were kind of coming through here. But the ones that were really kind of beat up, you couldn't even stop the people. 
They just were wanting to get to the rear. Uh, you had uh, 7th Armored Division, which was moving down from the spa area. They were told to get their butts to St. Fifth. So they're not going to stick around. And so basically what they were forced to do is grab anyone and anyone that came by. And they would get an anti-tank gun here. You know, they would get a tr uh, someone, a couple from there. And basically you just manned roadblocks everywhere you could. The key was that bridge in Malmedy, and of course there are other crossings here. So what goes in a typical roadblock? Well, anywhere from two to whatever you got for engineers, a platoon. Any tank mines, definitely. Uh, TNT explosives, if you want to take out a bridge. Bazookas, not very effective against directly against tanks, but not too bad on the side. And then Later on, you had time to put up concertina wire. Daisy chain. What's a daisy chain? Well, uh, you got this road you'd like to prevent people from coming across. You can either go out and put your mines in there, or dig them in, and all that stuff. But then if you want to drive over it, well, you don't want to. <laughs> so one way of doing it in a roadblock is you take a bunch of your anti-tank mines, take a long rope, tie them together and spacing it, you lay the mines kind of in a row, kind of like here. Here's the road. You take your rope coming across it. It's open to go. You see an enemy coming, you pull it, and you pull the mines across the road. Now, of course, you can see them. But the enemy, if he sees it too, is going to stop. And if you've got a bazooka or something off to the side, you can you know, make it bad for them. Uh, or at night, you probably won't see it. So that's kind of a standard thing to do, engineers will do to kind of mess your day a little bit. Well, lo and behold, while the Colonel Peregrine was there, and this was on the 17th, uh, B Battery of the 285th Field Artillery Observing Battal well, company, Battalion came through Malmedy. They were directed to get to St. Vith like other things. Uh, the captain who is head of uh, the particular unit actually talked to Colonel Peregrine who said, we don't think you want to go the direction you were told to because we know there's German forces out there. We don't know exactly where. Well, unfortunately, the captain who headed the company said, I was given direct orders to follow this route and don't now, this was about 11.30. So the, the company kind of came down through here, passed through a roadblock, a, a couple of them, got down to an area called Five Points, Bagnas, and they were beginning to go down this road here just as a German column was coming up this direction. This is a big open field. And lo and behold, the Germans opened fire, basically destroyed the beginning, the end, shot them up really bad. This is a unit of about 150 people. They surrendered. Uh, they were then moved into this field here. Uh, those that survived, uh, again, start about 150. There were about 110 probably by then. And Piper came up with this initial grouping here, but then he kept going. The second uh, Waffen-SS group came up, kind of lined them all up, and just opened fire. Uh, 84 of them were killed right off the bat. Uh, and how did we first find out this happened? Well, back in Malmedy, uh, Colonel Paragon was back there, and you could hear suddenly a bunch of firing going on. So he took a small group and they did a recon out here through the forest. And as they were kind of coming through there, three soldiers really distraught, wounded, came stumbling out explaining what happened. Uh, he immediately took them back, sent out some other engineers, and over the course of the rest of the day and stuff, 19 more <coughs> were recovered. He put together a very detailed report of what happened to include everything we knew about German forces moving, sent that to Spa, the First Army headquarters. He also said, 
you better get some more help down here because <laughs> we're, you know, we haven't got a lot. Uh, and what happened is originally the thought from the Germans was this would terrorize the Americans. We would just collapse and go. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, General Hodges, you know, for First Army up there, said, so, ah, they spread the word everywhere of what the Germans w were doing. And that actually is stable to stiffen the last everywhere. So again, 291st, right there at the right time. Stavlot, that's the next thing down. Piper decided, nah, we're not gonna try Malmedine, probably should have. Uh, it comes down to Stavlot. They're running way behind eight. So now it's at nighttime. <laughs> the 291st only had one squad there at that time. So what they ended up, whoops. So what they ended up doing, well, okay. They did whatever you could do. You put, a, a, put one cotton pick and a little roadblock out there. Uh, and at that time, Private Goldstein was part of that. Uh, oh, actually, he was out ahead of that. Uh, he heard the tanks coming along. Couldn't see him and everything. But he said he got out there and said, halt, halt. And then it just said everything went to pieces. <laughs> the Germans started shooting everywhere, you know, and everything. So he scampered back here. Uh, you know, the roadblock took a shot at him with a, a bazooka round or two. Uh, and it was enough to uh, cause a halt. Uh, at that time, I think Piper, who was coming up with this, uh, they were getting kind of exhausted. They'd been going since heaven knows when. And he said, oh, there must be a bunch of people there. We're going to hold off. Uh, so they, they spent, they stopped. And lo and behold, uh, what happens, it gave 12 hours time for us to reinforce Trois Points, Malmody. Uh, unfortunately, not enough. Well, actually, what was going on now at at Stavelot is we had some other units coming in there. Uh, the 526 uh, armored artillery group came in and, and gave a gun here. Major Solis was part of that. So now we started to reinforce this thing. Now, unfortunately, what kind of happened is one, the bridge was much bigger than the amount of demolitions we could destroy it with. Two, in the confusion that occurred that night, they think one of a small group of Sikorsky's guys passed through there and pulled the wiring off of the demolition. So eight o'clock, Piper sends his tanks barreling down the road to capture the bridge and get across. And lo and behold, the bridge doesn't blow. So he actually gets across, they're all right. But now you're in kind of the middle of a town which has all got stone buildings. Now granted, a lot of them have been kind of destroyed and everything, but now we got some armor, uh, infantry and stuff there. So they get into a, a big kind of fight along through here. Uh, eventually, uh, Major Solis, they get forced out of here and retreats back up. But lo and behold, there's a big gas dump along the road leading up through there. And the Germans don't know it. Uh, in fact, if you've seen the, seen the movie, uh, you know, Battle of the Bulls, there's this thing where Henry Fonda and they're up there and, and tanks are coming up this way and he rolls 55 gallons yeah. drums down and everyone explodes and all that stuff. That didn't happen. Uh, but a group of Belgium <laughs> guards there uh, started burning uh, some of the fuel there. Uh, but Major Solis and others got there in time and said, nope, nope, cease, and stop that. So what Piper, though, did at this point, this is the 18th. This is only two days after they've kind of started. <clears throat> he splits his group. A group stays here and fights to see Stavlot, and eventually does. He sends the rest of his group now down this road toward Trois Points. This is a critical place. It's a place where both you have, uh, we got the Somme River here, 
the Ambler River coming in here eventually comes up toward the Meuse. Trois points means three points, three bridges. Uh, if he can get across this bridge here and here, this is N23, which gives a very direct route up toward the Meuse and toward Antwerp. This becomes a critical place for him. At that point, C Company of the 51st, elements of A Company, the 291st, are the only ones there. But in the units that have been passing through there, uh, someone forgot they didn't pick up their anti-tank gun with them and stuff. So the engineers grab that, use it as part of you know, uh, you know, roadblocks and stuff. Uh, weren't able to stop them at all with that. But lo and behold, gave them time to get that ridge blown and these primed to go down through here. The Petit Spa Bridge was set, but it's a much weaker bridge. And at that point in time, they didn't bother, I guess, blowing it. <coughs> Piper got there just in time to see this thing blown. Well, at that point in time, you don't have a lot of options. So at this point, now his force is moving up toward La Gouillet's, uh, a town where they, again, all along the way, they wantonly killed a lot of civilians, over 110. Uh, supposedly, overall, the Sixth Army killed 300 POWs and stuff along the way. But every village they went to. What they were hoping to do was, if you could go up through Stomont, uh, you have a way of getting back toward the direction you want to go. But at this point in time, forces are beginning to move down in this area. So they move down, seize the bridge at Chenot. You can't get every bridge blown. But comes down through high, to High Beaumont. And here's their story. Uh, turn the volume up. What's Come on, guys. Well, did you plug it into the laptop? It's got to be plugged into the laptop. Okay. Okay. We'll give it another try. Yes. Did you say that it was the second SS that did the Albany massacre? Uh, well, I, I, I'd have to go back in and look. Those but it was. Same, those are the guys that uh, did that uh, town on the way to Normandy, uh, Sourdou, mm -hmm. Glad, where they put everybody in oh, the churches the, the, and burned them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there. Okay. Okay, let's give it another try. Turn the volume up a little. Yeah. In anticipation of this, Colonel Bergman's S3 Major Lamp ordered Lieutenant Edelstein and his platoon of Company A to prepare the bridge for the Gives you an idea what this sort of operations would be like for the engineers. It had been blown by the Germans once before. Bring their retreat into the Sinfried Line. The 291st had rebuilt it as a timber. Lumber? Yeah. Now we prepare to destroy it again. It was 3.30 in the afternoon of the 18th. The bridge was prepared with 2,500 pounds of explosive and defended by Lieutenant Edelstein and 22 men. At 4.15, a group of civilians on bicycles approached the bridge and warned Edelstein's men. That's why you don't blow bridges immediately. Timber, dirt, and rocks. 
second charge wasn't necessary. Since the surrounding area was very swampy, there was no opportunity for heavy armor to cross or ford the creek. We then tried to get a couple of small half tracks across the bridge at Forge, and we were ready for that move, too. Sergeant Billington and Johnny Rondonell of Lieutenant Edelstein's platoon pulled daisy chain mines across the roads as the half tracks approached. And up they went. Piper stopped cold. The entry marked the furthest penetration of his armored column during the Battle of the Gulf. After the war, when Piper was asked what he thought when he stopped him at the end creek, he said, all I could do was pound my knee and scream, the damned engineers, the damned engineers. <laughs> and so long, and he would forever be proud. The damned engineers. <laughs> so, that's as far as he could get. At this point in time, he's forced to return to La Glaise. At this time, things are closing down. The 30th Infantry now is moving down towards Stavelot. And shortly we'll seize the town again. Piper's stuck back here on this side of the river. The main German forces are still on the other side. Oh, and all I can kind of say here is the 21st Stavelot's recaptured. Temps by 1st SS Panzer and the scories to rescue him fail. On the 24th of December, uh, Piper abandons everything, all his vehicles and stuff, and they basically just infiltrate back uh, across the, uh, the Somme River and reunites with the rest of the German forces, which are still kind of hanging around there trying to figure out what to do. Just the last thing which was interesting, the last major effort was Otto Skorzeny asked, you know, his initial mission of infiltrating and doing all that's fail. So he just says, look, I'm a basic, you know, armored brigade now. I want to go ahead and see what we can last do to rescue everyone. But at this time, Malmody, we have more than enough forces there. So again, 291st has obstacles all over the place here. We now got wire, uh, everything. Skorzeny attacks. Uh, in two wings, but ends up getting repulsed. The, the thing which, you know, no good deed goes unturned, or unrewarded, I guess you might say, is that uh, while all this has been kind of going on, the newspapers wherever down, to include what the Germans were putting out, had been saying Malmody is actually occupied by the Germans, not the U.S. forces. So lo and behold, Good old 9th Tactical Air Force attacks Malmody oh. on the 21st. Everyone screams and says, we're here, we're friends, don't. They come back on the 24th and the 25th and bomb them again. Uh, again, sadly kills a bunch of the soldiers and, and stuff who are there. Uh, but someone finally believes uh, they aren't there. So. Eventually, the 82nd Airborne came down and reinforced Trois Points. They actually came involved and were support with the fighting around St. Vith. And uh, Major General Gavin actually had a nice comment to say about the role of the engineers during that period. Uh, and yeah, they were really pretty good. They never could have stopped fully you know, without the final support of the infantry and the armor. But initially, you got some good uh, rivers and other obstacles. You can do a lot. So without just getting into a lot here, uh, the counteroffensive finally gets going. What I haven't really pointed out, and haven't talked about the 51st, but they basically were doing the same thing all along the Ore River. Uh, you, know, base, you know, putting in obstacles, uh, blowing bridges, doing everything. And that prevented the... Uh, Germans from, they, and they tried to push through there. And this is kind of the, you know, basic time period here. You know, 26, you know, Patton's lead vehicles finally get the Bastogne, but that doesn't mean you've totally cleared the Germans out of there. 16th of January, you know, 
we finally start pushing our way back and squeezing down from both sides. And the 16th of January, 1st and 3rd Army finally meet at Hoofley's. Uh, anywhere I've seen the 25th to the 28th of January, we've finally pushed everything back and we're kind of back to where we started. How did they name it the Battle of the Bulge? Oh, <laughs> well, if you look at it, what do you think that looks like? It does, that's what I was uh, thinking about it. Yeah. And that came up, the military, historically we always call it the Ardennes Offensive or Counteroffensive. Uh, newspapers picked that up as the Battle of Bulge, and so that quick stuff. The last thing I just wanted to kind of, as a, a quick postscript, and I'm sorry I'm going a little longer, I actually had an opportunity to visit there. In 1994, all the little towns in that little area, Malmedy, Baston, all the others, had celebrations commemorating the, 95th, uh, the 50th anniversary of the Battle of, uh, you know, well, the Battle of the Bulge. And so they had festivals, they invited all the old, you know, veterans, units, whoever they could find to come back. Well, the town of Hoofleys decided they would have theirs on the 13th to 16th of January because that was what they called the second time they were liberated there. And there again is a picture of uh, Hoofleys. Well, they sent out a special invitation to anyone they could find of the 30, 334th Infantry Regiment, who were the group that came down from the north, and the 11th Armored Division, in particular the 41st Armored Cavalry Recon Squadron, basic Task Force Green. Well, Task Force Green was headed by my father-in-law. Uh, he was a major at the time. Uh, when he finally retired, he was a Brigadier General and Assistant Division Commander of the 25th Infantry in Vietnam. Marvelous gentleman. Uh, sadly died. Him in Vietnam? Yes. And actually, well, kind of. Yeah. And I have a sneaking suspicion the reason I ended up in the 25th was because of him. <laughs> because I was only one of thousands of, you know, replacements coming in there. Yeah. Uh, and he must have whispered in the ear to the battalion commander or someone and said, why don't you get this guy? Uh -huh. And what was kind of interesting when I flew into Saigon, I'm sorry to drag this out a little bit, you know, I was in this big hall with everyone else, you know, and we'd just come off a plane and we're kind of half dozing. And so we were checking in and all that stuff. And then suddenly I heard this name saying, Captain Fellows, report to so-and-so. They actually said, report to this door. So I wandered on over there. And they said, oh, okay, come with me. Get on this helicopter. And I said, what? Yeah, I don't even know where I'm going. And then they flew me up to Coochie, you know, and plopped me into a, a room. And then lo and behold, uh, General Green walked in. And I said, oh, okay. you know. And first thing he said was, take off your captain bars. Because I, I, I become a captain, you know, kind of in transit. Right. And so then he promoted me officially Dang. there. But marvelous gentleman. But again, just a picture of the link up, which did occur. Uh, and it wasn't an easy. The Germans just didn't roll over and walk away. They kind of fought their way in. And the sad thing is you look at the, all of these little towns, and this doesn't really show it, just decimated. The Germans fired artillery to block things, and then we fired more artillery to take it back. So yeah, that was us. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was General Green coming back. That's his son, Michael. M Mike's Larry, uh, son Larry, who's now a major in the Marine Corps, and Mike, me. That was confusing yeah. when I was first showing up kind of, uh, you know, courting Becky and the grandparents there, and where they'd say, Michael, and you get three different responses. <laughs> so he was Mike Green. Uh, no, yeah, Mike, Mike, he was Michael, and I was Mike Fellows. So anyway, this, and again, they had a marvelous little reunion celebration. These were all members of the 341st or, you know, recon group of General Greens. Uh, they had a marvelous reception. There was the mayor of Hoofleys, his wife, General Green, the military attache, came out from Brussels. 
And that gentleman, I think, might be the same one as that. Uh, and they had a marvelous ceremony. They had, in fact, all the little towns, mm -hmm. you know, have monuments to the Amen. units and stuff that, you know, release them. Uh, we had a nice ceremony at Hoofleys who lost their lives. A lot of it doing the artillery, but when, during the service, they read off a listing of 110 names. And I just asked the gentleman who was with me, how did they die? And he said, well, during the last little bit where the Germans were coming through, the last bit of their relief, uh, the townspeople all went to the church for protection. Well, a flight of a bombers came over us, trying to take out a bridge that was a couple hundred yards down the line. Missed the bridge, but hit the church. They never mentioned that at all, ever, during the thing. Yeah, and then what was so nice, they had a luncheon reception and their young children, older people came up and gave cards to the veterans. And just to read this, this was an example of just one. Thank you and welcome in Belgium. You are the best men in the world. You gave your blood and your... <laughs> I always kind of break out. But anyway, you can kind of get the idea. Uh, they definitely you know, appreciate anywhere where we were with that. And there was another one. But there's no question they appreciated, you know, what we kind of did. So anyway, just kind of, I had to end with this. Just a, well, okay, where's the music? You <laughs> sing it. <laughs> yeah. What? Well. Well. Oh, well. Thank you. I'm sorry to drag out.